And today, the one and only Tante Poldi, Auntie Poldi by Mario Giordano. Obviously, I'm super passionate about this book because it's a very nice story. Um, as always, we have to follow, you know, uh, discussion rules. I didn't translate this into English because it's, you know, quite clear. We want to stay, if we speak about certain topic, we speak about this topic and we don't jump, you know, or, you know, and, and go in different ways if possible. How, what we'll do, we'll have chat with Mario, then we will have discussion and then we will wrap up. We'll meet your, Mario and, and his amazing auntie Poldi and many others. And this event is for me really, really special because I believe that books always find you. Uh, that's this snowy city here, it's Graz. Graz is a second largest city in Austria. And in a way, it well, it used to be my home. Now, now it's some now I'm here in England, but let's say that this is kind of one of my homes. And once per year, normally in January, where it actually really looks like this. I go to Graz and I stay there maybe a week or maybe 10 days. And you know, when you leave, it's sometimes you know always a bit this strange feeling because you have normally I go to Vienna by, by train. And uh, yeah, it's nice. It's nice to go, but it's also a bit nostalgic. And then that was one day, I think it was, yeah, it was 19, no, 2019. And I went again this train, it was early flight, it's super cold, and I decided to wait in a waiting room. And then I found this book, Tante Poldi. And I said, oh, you know, I took it, I checked, somebody around, nobody, okay. Then I started to read a little bit. And why it was so interesting for me, it was because it was written about this German woman who decides to move to Italy. And when I was 19 years old, I actually enrolled uh, to, uh, to the university here in Graz, and I decided to study Italian language. And in my class, or yeah, in my class, well, basically we were 24, 23 girls, and one boy. And out of these 23 girls, 22 had a ragazzo italiano, had a, an Italian boyfriend somewhere. And they were totally, you know, connected. Even, you know, the professor had Italian husband. And there were two losers there in the back. The boy who didn't have any ragazzo italiano and myself. And I was just, gee, I didn't pick the wrong class because it was so just, gosh, what should I do now? Anyway, and that was also for me so interesting you know, this love, love relationship between, you know, German speaking people and Italian. So I said, well, okay, I need to read that because I love Italy, but well, maybe not so in this way. And then uh, here, if you know the linguist, we had an article that was volume 60. This was, uh, it was just before, in the middle of the summer, I think it was, where it's shortly written about <laughs> Mario and his books and stuff. Uh, it will be good to read. And now here we come, Mario Giordano. Uh, I won't now go into his biography and stuff because we will chat about that. But it would be good if you like to know more about him. He has a really good website, which is www.mariogiordano.de. But be, you know, if you Google Mario Giordano, you will also find an Italian politician. But Ma Mario, you will tell about that, just uh, that I finished this. Mario is on Twitter. And he's called Grumpy Giordano, which is a really cool name. He has Facebook and he has Instagram. And I put that all on our website. This is already on our uh, Facebook, but I will put it again after, after we stopped uh, with presentation. I really like this picture of Mario, artist's work. I believe in artists. I think this is important image because we all know what happened in 2020 and I think a lot of artists, uh, especially performing artists, suffered a lot. So I think it's good to show support if you can. And then, okay, this is then for later. So I'll stop sharing. Okay, um, Mario, hello. Thank you for being here. 
would you mind, you know, just telling a few things about yourself before we start in this story with you Google Mario Giordano, what happens? Okay, yeah. First of all, thank you, Romana, for, for, for inviting me, for, for having me uh, tonight on this online event here. I'm really excited and and um and, and happy to be here and it's 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 actually an honor and um uh, hello everybody good evening uh from germany to um, the uk argentina germany somewhere else i don't know where you, are, you guys are i'm really happy to be here so yeah what can i say about myself i'm a writer um i uh, i have actually no no degree um and so um, uh, I'm, I'm one. Uh, I'm a type of guy who who has no other skills than writing. I'm just a writer. I write. Mm -hmm. So can you just before we go into deeper Maria Giordano, if we Google Maria Giordano, this strange guy pops up. Who's that? Yeah, well, he's he's pretty famous in in Italy. He's a journalist and politician, or a political journalist, um, uh, as far as I know, pretty right wing journalist, and uh, he also published a lot of books. So he's um, he's a celeb political celebrity in 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 Italy. But I have to say that my name is one of the most common names in Italy, in, in general like Mario in my generation was super popular. And then Giordano is, I think, the 10th most popular and mo most common name in, in Italy. So uh, if you flip up um, a telephone book in Italy, wherever you are, uh, you'll find thousands of Mario Giordanos. Or if you Google Mario Giordano, you find uh, a lot. So I'm just one of them. Yeah, but Mario Giordano, as you are here today, you're actually a German writer. You're a German I'm, guy, aren't you? I'm, 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 I'm pretty German by Italian means, so to say. <laughs> I, I, I had an Italian father and a German mother. I was born in Germany, grew up in Germany, and we only spoke German at home because my father was four when he came to Germany in the 1930s, actually. And uh, so German was, he spoke German like his natives, like, in, like his native language. And since in the 1960s, bilingu bilingual education was, well, people didn't know so very well how, how it works, how, how it would work out. So to avoid the risk and because it was so convenient, they only spoke German. So I had to learn Italian. And I did it when like in my, I think in my mid twenties, when I, deeply fell in love for the first time in Italy during holidays, I decided it would be a pretty good idea uh, to understand and to speak a little. So I bought myself a vocabulary and a grammar and taught myself Italian, like uh, in an autodidactic way. And so I, uh, I do speak it. I get along quite well, but uh, as, as a very beloved foreign language. So I make mistakes. I have a pretty weird accent. And uh, uh, yeah, but I, I love Italy. I love the language. And I'm trying to be there as much as I can over the year. Yeah. So I have a question for our friends here. I'll put a gallery view on. Um, can you tell me, did you read the book Antipoldi? How many did you read the book? One, not so much, two. Okay, not, not, not so many, but doesn't matter. Oh. So uh, Mario, please. yeah, Mario, can you, can you please give us a quick, you know, summary of the book and then we'll continue. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty simple. It's about Isolde Oberreiter. Uh, called Poldi, uh, uh, who in her 60s or went before on her 60s birthday, moves to Sicily from Bavaria, from Munich, Bavaria. She's Bavarian, in order, intending to drink herself to death with a, with a sea view. But uh, something always comes in her way. And usually it's a murder case. And as stubborn as she is, 
she um, she's try, trying to solve the murder case and um, and then she has a knack for um, policemen especially one Italian um, detective uh, Vito Montana so she falls in love finds back some joy of life uh, still drinks has a lot of fun and uh, she's a um, yeah, kind of a hippie character uh, from the 1950s, uh, 60s, and uh, with an exciting life. And the whole story is narrated by her nephew from Germany, because the Italian family sends him in from Germany to um, pay attention to her, to to dump the, the alcohol and, 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 and make sure that she's not dying. And he is a wannabe writer trying to write a big family saga, always fails because it's a trashy shit what he's writing. And um, he's a nerd, embarrassed for, of everything. Um, but then he tries to be a, a very good chronic, uh, chronist of his aunt's adventures and tries to be as honest and, and detailed as possible. So, uh, the aunt has a lot of adventures, even a lot of sex, actually, because she's um, still enjoying that part of life. And the nephew is totally embarrassed to tell us about that, but he does. So this is, and then it's it's crime fiction. It's what we call it in Germany, it's cozy crime. So funny crime fiction, you might not have the term in, in the UK, but we call it cozy crime. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's crime fiction, it's mystery, but with a, funny attempt yeah so i virtually fell in love with that and i read all five books and i bought all audio books and i'm listening in in english and everybody needs to join this <laughs> i hope you're fine like i'm Dante Poldi, and even you need to listen and learn about it because it's really really good you know it sparks your life a little bit i say okay how, okay, when was Auntie Poldi born? So how did you find her as an author? Yeah, I mean, when you read Auntie Poldi and, and, and I told you about the narrative perspective that everything is narrated by the nephew, you might have the idea that the nephew has something to do with the writer himself. So, and there's a little truth in it. I, since like over 20 years, I, I, I wanted to write a big family saga, the story, the history of my Italian family, which starts in the late 19th century. And um, I, I, never, I never made it. I never got to grips with it. I, I, I did not have a story, no protagonist, nothing. And I always failed. And then at a certain point, I thought, okay, well, don't make it too difficult, Mario. You just write, write about Sicily in a genre you're familiar with, which is mystery, and make it funny, probably. So uh, why so serious? Love, try to make it funny. And then I had this aunt, uh, Poldi. There was a Poldi. I had an aunt, Poldi. She was Bavarian. She moved to Sicily when she was 60. She tried and made it, actually, to drink herself to death with the sea view. We all loved her and uh, she was a dramatic character, not as much as my protagonist, but she was kind of a blueprint for, for Poldi for me. So I moved in her abandoned house for a year in Sicily, stayed there and developed, uh, developed started developing the series and um, and uh, funnily enough, it, writing Antipoldi series um, opened me up for, for this family saga. And then I, I could write it and it will be published um, in spring now. In spring. It's really nice how, you know, how characters appear and then they take, they take you in the right way. So yes, you how... books find you, and mm -hmm. even characters find you, and 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 writers are found by their material and found by their books too. This is mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's that's the truth. It's um, you you as as Picasso said, "I'm not searching, I'm finding." Mm -hmm. 
Mm. It describes the creative process in a brilliant way, uh, but it's uh, practically very hard because when you don't find, you, you have a problem, yeah, you, you want to find and, and you don't find, you know, you don't always find, yeah, well. Mm. So now you've wrote, let's say you wrote the books, they are selling well, and now it comes to this option, okay. Shall we translate one of Mario Giordano's books? How, how does this actually work? How did it happen in your case? Because you have some books which are translated. Yeah, usually it works the, the, the simple way that the, the publishing houses go on book fairs or they, they meet the agents or the other foreign publishers on book fairs and they're dealing licenses, uh, they're dealing translation rights. Uh, for for very very small money. So for a translation, writers usually don't earn more than like thousand or two thousand euros. It's uh, um, and then the book gets translated, which is always very exciting because it gets a new cover, a different language, entirely different audience. Um, it's it's always an honor. It's always a pleasure. Uh, it fills up your bookshelf. And, um, but with Antipoldi in the UK and in the US, it was a little different. It was a little like um, a billiard, it was a ping pong play. So uh, there was a very tiny um, British publisher, Lemon Press, Bitter Lemon Press, who discovered Antipoldi, bought the rights, published it. Then a bigger uh, British uh, publishing house um, uh, discovered it. That was Hotter Staunton. So they bought the rights from Bitter Lemon Press, published it, uh, and then uh, because they belong to the Hachette Group, and then Hart, Houghton Mifflin, uh, oh God, I can't spell the name, HMH Press in, in the US, um, are connected with Hotter Staunton. And the, the editors talked and, and uh, talked about Antipoldi. And so the Americans said, oh, well, this could be nice for our market too. And then they even decided to make it a top title. So uh, if I, I was like pretty, it was just lucky, uh, lucky enough to be translated, not in, only into English and be uh, on sale uh, in the UK, but also um, in the US, which is a, a pretty, pretty huge market. And um, that was really, really exciting. But usually, um, it's dealed by by the publishing houses. Mm -hmm. Writer will be the writer will be informed, but uh, uh, we have no say in that. Mm -hmm. Because you your translator is quite famous. Did you meet him? John Brownjohn. Yeah. I didn't meet him. Never met him. We we talked a couple of times on the phone. We had an email exchange. And then like, I think it was two or three, already three years back, I don't know, uh, that his wife sent me an email that uh, John had passed away recently. So uh, this is really, it's really a pity. I'm really sad because he's, he was such a brilliant translator. And um, I mean, it's rarely the case that you can read the translations. Um, I, I can't check my Turkish translations. I, uh, I have a hard time checking my Polish translations, but of course it's different with, uh, with an English translation. I can check it quite well. And uh, he, he really did a good job and um, we were in touch a lot. Yeah, because I also think that his translations was brilliant. Uh, yeah. I read it in English as well. And uh, because we are a lot of, this will be interesting discussion afterwards because there are, I know there are a lot of translators here, you know, to, to deep, to dive into that topic a little bit more. Okay, now, now you said you have these books in languages which you don't speak, right? So how do you know if it's good or not? Well, um, if I don't speak the language, yeah. uh, I, I ask friends, uh, like for, for the Polish translations, I, I sent the books to, to, to my Polish friends because I was really excited that they finally could read my books and ask them, so uh, how, did you, how do you find it? Can you check a little bit on, 
on the language on on you know uh, uh, can you tell me how the translation is so that's what i do i i send the books to friends who speak the language and uh, ask them for for feedback for an opinion which is very uh very personal of course but this is at least um uh, a, a way of, of checking the quality of the translation in other language i have no chance like when it comes to i don't know like yeah, yeah turkish is, is okay but uh lithuanian for example i don't have lithuanian friends right and uh, i could never check the translation mm. what do you wish from translator or expect from translator if there is such a thing well i mean it's needless to say and and most of you guys when you translate have it and most translators have it but it's respect uh not only respect uh towards the the writer uh or but respect to the to the text to the to the book and um and then it would be nice if translators are uh, keep themselves a little updated to the uh, everyday culture of the of the country, because language changes a lot. And for example, I use a lot of the, the, the narrator uses a lot of like everyday terms, contemporary terms um, uh, when he speaks and when he narrates, which are tricky to, to translate. And if you if you're not up to date with you know how Germans speak uh, on the streets, um, you will have a hard time translating it. And uh, so it's always nice. It's always recommended to keep a little um, on the pulse of of life. But then, and I mean, needless to say, you have to love what you do, right? Mm, yeah. Okay. Now it's I think good time. If we jump a little bit to your books before we go then in other topics, I'll share my screen again. Uh, let's just say this one. Can you see my screen? Yes, I yeah. can see. Yeah, probably everybody, just a moment. Because what I thought was really, really good to present here. So we had Mario supporting God. Then we have, okay. So, what I like normally, it's Goodreads. You can find Mario on Goodreads. Um, you probably know that. And that's, uh, for example, that's the book which I'm actually listening right now. And I think it's in English that I'm listening at. And it's uh, really good. Can you tell a few things about this book before we go to your website? You mean Cotton Reloaded? Yeah. Uh, yes, I. Um, it's uh, kind of a sequel um, of a very classic um, pulp novel series in Germany. Uh, the, the, the original pulp novel series was called Jerry Cotton, uh, which is a, a, a FBI agent from New York solving mysteries. And um, it was, it started in the 1950s or 60s. It was very cheap pop novels and they were very su super popular, still, still available in Germany. And the publishing house decided it was like, a, like six years back or so to, or even a little, or seven years back to go digital and to refurbish the series a little bit for the digital market. So I was invited to write the, the first episode of the new Jerry Cotton series. And um, yeah, it was fun doing it. Um, it's, uh, it's not a, a big novel. It's, uh, uh, it would be not more than 100 pages, actually, uh, because it has um, pulp novel size. And uh, but it was fun writing it. I I decided to, to to do something different in in my narrative perspective, and um, yeah. But it was a genre piece, so to say. Yeah. So I will tell you a little bit. I mean, I I just kind of started. So it's a it's really cool book. It starts um, with this young boy who is with uh, his family in New York. They come from you know Central America, right? Central from I forgot which state it is and um, in this family it's a son a daughter a daughter is super successful working in Twin Towers in New York 
and um, the family has some shop with fishing and um, similar, you know, stuff there in this little place. And they go to to visit the sister, so because it's written from perspective of this boy, and he just the boy is kind of young, let's say a teenager towards an end, and decides that he wants to live in Manhattan and everything's great, and they have this fam family, you know, quarrel and stuff, and he decides just to go up out because he's fed up, and on that day. Uh, his family is visiting the sister in Twin Towers and of course, you know, the accident happens and that's the last day that, uh, well, he sees them and then it goes from there and then he say, he runs there, he saves some people from this Twin Tower and then uh, a lady that he saves um, helps him and he can live with her and then he becomes a policeman. And he's kind of happy, but you know, maybe he wants to become, you know, more wants to educate himself more. And then they are, you know, circling with his uh, partner, and then he is witness to a murder. And then it starts, and it's it's good. So I recommend. Next one, uh, which I have here, it's uh, of course a beautiful present this Christmas for ladies and gentlemen, Tante Poldi. Just saying, it's really good. If you are a woman, let's say my age plus, you will love it. It's really good. Gentlemen as well, because my partner loves it too. And he is uh, 10 years older than me. So it's good for both. This is now the new book, right, Mario? Yes. That's the I, one. Mm -hmm. That's the family saga, which will come out in March, mid, mid of March in Germany. And um, yeah. I'll be waiting for the translations then. Yeah. How many pages are there? It's because... 544. Wow. Super. It's only the first part. I'm, I'm currently writing, currently working on the second part. Okay. So uh, it will be chronological. So no, 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 no. It will. Be, that's the point. I can't. I can't do two parts in chrono chronological order because it would be too disappointing for the readers of part one and uh, too frustrating. So the second part will be narrated from a different perspective. There will be a uh, generation shift and there will be a shift of, of protagonists. So uh, uh, what I plan is that you can read the books independently um even in a different and uh, in, in a, mm -hmm. a, a beginning with part two um but the, the material was uh, uh, too too big I, it was uh, I, I, I need I couldn't write it in in 500 plus pages I needed more more space so I mm -hmm. well now we're looking forward to read that and then I think these two books are really uh, important because um, this experiment actually that became a film, right? Right. Yeah, it was. I I, I wrote this novel based on the notorious Stanford prison experiment. I probably have heard about it. There was a psychological experiment in the, in 1971 in Stanford University where they try to find out where all the violence in prisons comes from. So they made an experiment uh, simulating a prison in, in, the, uh, in the university with voluntary uh, subjects, uh, usually it was uh, students, psychological students, divided into two groups, prisoners and guards. And they were asked to play prison for 14 days and they had a little set of rules not very much and after day one the situation totally escalated and led into humiliation violence and the whole experience had to be aborted after day five or six and when i studied psychology i immediately knew that uh, it's a brilliant that's brilliant material for a thriller but i uh, always thought okay there must be a, a American novel or, or film it, which I just don't know about. But when I learned that there is nothing, I decided that was in the late uh, 98, 99, 
I decided to, to write a book because it's, um, as, as you might imagine, it has a little to do with Germany's history of aggression and obedience, the dynamics of aggression and obedience. So I thought it's, it might be a good idea that a German writes it. So I wrote a novel based on sort of this experiment. And uh, before the book uh, got published, the film rights were sold. Uh, and Oliver Hirschbiegel, German director, um, uh, made, a, made a movie from it. And um, it went abroad quite, quite a lot. So it was uh, shown in theaters all over Europe and, and the world. And it, there was there's even a US remake with starring, starring Adrian Brody and Forrest Whitaker. But unfortunately, it's not good. Yeah, uh, so my personal opinion. But um, yes, the experiment is um, is based on the film is based on my novel. I even wrote the screenplay, and um, but the, the film is still more. But more don't fun. worry, Mario, because mm -hmm. they don't worry about that because they are repeating all the films again and again. So you know, just five years. Yeah, more. they yeah they're repeating. I just don't earn from it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, yeah, I have a bad contract. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, we, we'll change that. We'll change that somehow. <laughs> it's great. I haven't read the book. It's on my to-do, in my to-read list. And this one I find really interesting. And you like that. Uh, Der Ausland Doc. Can you tell us about that? Because that's, um, you know, compulsory literature in, in schools, I think, for A-levels, right? That's right. It's a, it's a young adult novel. Mm -hmm. uh, placed in Hamburg. I wrote it like uh, 24 years back and um, it's a story about young people having experienced an adventure uh, in Hamburg. Um, it's about um, uh, a, 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 a bulldog, a, a pit bulldog and friendship, first love um, and stuff in uh, in Hamburg and somehow it's, it's that's um, it, it it's a very personal book many years back and I'm really flattered and uh, moved that it's still available and it's still read in uh, in schools and once in a while I get mails and, and letters from from students in uh, yeah, from Hamburg um, uh, who have, have have the task to 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 write the writer a letter and uh, they're really moving. These letters are really moving. And sometimes they, they contact me on Instagram or wherever they find me asking for help because they have to, they have a commission for uh, some homework and they just asking me to do their homework, which is fun then. But I, uh, I, I still love this book. Yes, it's really strange. I mean, um, the currency in this book is still Deutschmarks, not Euro. And uh, there's no no cell phones, and uh, because the the time where it's playing, it's in the late '80s, uh, and it's a miracle for me that mm, kids kind of like it, but somehow they do. Okay, good. Okay, so now we go to your books. That's I already opened the page. So this is Mario's page, which is MarioGiordano.de. And obviously we will check today his books in English. So we have a website in English and in German. So Auntie Paul Divino, by the way, if you like audio books, the, I mean, the narrator, it's brilliant in German and in English, really nice, nice narrators. Then, okay, that's another one, right? That's the sequel. That's the, that's the, the, the second part there is, Four, there are four parts of the series are four episodes are out. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Just, yeah, because they are five. They're not all on the website. I, I, I need to update the website. Yeah. I just see that I need to update it. But there are more, more books which you have here. Oh, this is all my international editions uh -huh. uh, from, from various books. There's, for example, I wrote a book, uh, it, it was an inspirational book about feelings. A thousand Gefühle für dies keine Namen gibt, which in, which translate to translates to thousand feelings for which there are no names. And I really like this, like the translation 
not only because it's so brilliantly translated, but um, every it's a list of thousand feelings, and every each feeling is hand lettered in the American edition. I really love that. And um, this book got, has got many translations into Chinese, Korean, Italian, French, Netherlands. Uh, what else? A, uh, um, a, a few other translations. Mm -hmm. And um, I just try to to put you know some examples of of, of my various uh, foreign editions there to to give an impression about what you know about my. Work. How did you get this idea to write a book like that? To actually write the, my first book, right? Yeah, you mean that one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, I always dreamed of becoming a writer. I read a lot when I was young, and and then I I, I started to make up stories, which I told you know in school breaks on the yard, in, this, in on the schoolyard, and I realized I had audience, and I liked to make up stories and I thought it would it could be a nice profession you know you stay safe at home it's warm you don't have to go out it's very cozy not much work not hard um, uh, brilliantly paid yeah <laughs> and uh, you immediately get famous and uh, so I wanted to become a writer and um, never knew how to do it and then when during university actually I realized, yeah, well, Mario, if you really want to become a writer, um, you should get to grips and 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 start writing. You should start a book. You start. You should start writing a book, because if you don't do it, you will blame everyone for not um, having made it to be a writer uh, when you're old, like when in your mid forties. Um, so that was the idea. So I started to write a book in semester breaks. Um, and that was a children's book. It was a pirate's novel for kids because it was fun to write it. And uh, so then I had a manuscript and I sent it to various uh, publishing houses with a short letter. This is my first book. Maybe you like to publish it. Um, uh, let me know. If not, please send me back the manuscript. I need to send it to another publisher. Uh, uh, that was in the early 90s. And then after um, uh, 10 more or less friendly letters saying no, uh, no way, um, there was a publishing house saying, yes, we liked it. We want to want to make a book from it. Out from it. And uh, so that was uh, the start. And then uh, they immediately asked for for the second book, and then I um, introduced myself to a, to a TV production who produced um, um, uh, an animation, a puppet animation series for kids TV in Germany because I wanted to write screenplays. So I just tried to do something, and I tried to write, and um, and then one thing came to another. And uh, but it was a hard, it was a bumpy road. The first years, I for like more than six or seven years, I nearly earned nothing from it. But I, I at least I got published and uh, I, I continued writing. So before we go to discussion, I have a question because I know you like languages. Which languages do you speak? Oh. oh, well, apart from German, yeah. uh, English, yes, as you hear, more or less well. Um, I speak Italian, more or less well. I do speak a little French. Um, and since uh, when you speak Italian and a little French, and you are familiar with Roman languages, and you, you pick up a vocabulary for, for, for two hours, I do speak a little Spanish. Uh, or at least I, I understand and I can read. I um, I tried to learn Hungarian, but then dumped it, uh, in, in, not because it was too difficult, because that was the idea. I, I wanted to learn a very difficult language, but I didn't have the time anymore. But I loved Hungarian, actually. And since a year, I'm trying to learn Korean. 
and um, it's super difficult uh, because it's so very differently structured but i love it i love i love the language i hope that i will can keep up the discipline to continue learning learning mm -hmm. korean besides that i don't know um which other language no this is the language i, I actually do speak yeah because why do you like korean i know you like korean dramas i like korean dramas i have a yeah i mean uh, what's the reason i have a korean partner that's uh, first of all so when you have a, 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 a partner from a different culture then then you you're of course interested and uh, and you want to understand not only um, the people but uh, you want to understand the culture and and language is the key to every culture uh, in, 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 in my point of view. So um, I love the sound of the language. I love Korean dramas, but not only because, you know, because I have a Korean partner and so forth, but because from a, a screenwriter's point of view, they're brilliant. Korean drama, contemporary drama is, is really, really brilliant. It's brave. They, they are so courageous to mix genres which we in Europe would never dare to, to, to mix together. It's highly emotional. It's always highly emotional. It's always about values. And the storytelling is really, really nice. It's something, sometimes it's totally over the top. And, uh, but I, I, I admire the, the craft of, of Korean writers. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So you should come here to London in New Malden, you have Little Korea. And yeah, I mean, there's Korean film festivals even in Germany now. And really? It's, yeah. yeah, it's, it's uh, my, I mean, all over the world. It's, yeah. uh, it's, it's massive, it's huge. And the K-pop community all over the world is, is big. Like, uh, and people are learning the language just because they want to understand the lyrics of the bands. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, Okay, Mario, these were all my questions. We are kind of still good on time. And I have a question for you. Do you have questions for us here? Because now we're going to our discussion. Those who are in our you know, sessions, you know, we always chat. Everybody's welcome to say. But, well, I, don't, mm -hmm. I don't have any questions so far, but I'm, yeah. I'm curious to- To hear. To hear, yeah. Yeah, okay. Do you have any questions for Mario? I mean, you have questions because we always have questions. And I will open the chat now yeah. uh, uh, so I can see what's... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Alex, do you have a question? Because you always have a question. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I always do. It's funny, I've got my headphones in so I can, I can hear you and I, I sound, I can't hear myself. I was just thinking, about um when someone is a writer like mario is as mario is um does mario think or believe does anyone else for that matter <clears throat> that writing books is leading to not necessarily a higher state of thinking but is it is it in any way philosophical is it about doing things better for the next generation or is it is it trying to change the world cultural politics or is there more to writing in general than um than a, than an industry is it trying to better mankind okay um yes <laughs> oh <laughs> basically yes um but let me uh, uh, let me answer a little um, a little longer. Um, first of all, when I write, and most of the writers I know, when they write, it's not about changing the world. I don't know if writing can change the world. Pro maybe some books or literature in general can, but it's not about, from my perspective, about you know revolutions. It's about evolution. Uh, about society cannot um, sustain without culture and arts. 
And first, when you write, it's not about changing the world. You want to entertain. Because as Voltaire said, every kind of art is allowed except the boring one. So the first rule is never be boring. Because when you want to have an audience, when you want people to listen to you, you have to give a promise. And the promise is, please stay and please keep some change ready for me later and listen what I have to say, because I will, I will tell you a story and I, will, I promise I won't bore you. This is the first thing. And I mean, when, when you look at kids, I mean, newborn babies uh, or, or, or some, uh, little kids, when they are fat, when they are uh, clean, and when they got fresh clothes, the next thing they ask for is tell me your story. So stories are a basic human need. And I think it comes right after, like, what is it? Uh, eat, drink, um, uh, uh, like uh, 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 reproduce, uh, 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 clean your body or whatever. It's, it's like on, on fifth or sixth place. Uh, there is a need for stories because the world is too complicated. Um, we cannot learn it in all in school. We are, it's, we are part, when you're, as a storyteller, you're part of the myth, not of the, the mythos, not of the logos. The logos is analyzes is everything you learn in school or in university, but it's not enough. The other skills and, and, the, and the, the, the old, all the knowledge you need to know to survive in this world, even uh, socially survive, it's transported via stories and art and, and books, stories, films are, in my point of view, are uh, uh, our practical magic, our practical telepathy, because you, you're connected with the brain of another person, the writer or the reader. And uh, so it's a magic process. And uh, yes, uh, we need that. We really need that. And we don't need it to, to change the world entirely, but to evolve as humans. We need art. Thank you. Yeah, it's really good. So um, you have, Mario, you have two questions in the chat. From in the Gilles. chat. So I need my glasses. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Glynis, maybe you can read it out loud that it gets a bit interactive. Uh, yeah, it's about uh, John, the translator, John Brown, John, who also translated Walter Moers. Yes, I did know that. Uh, because when, when they told me that um, a guy called, uh, named John Brown John, which is a funny name actually, uh, is translating my books, I thought it's a pseudonym and uh, I, I, I googled him and uh, I found out, yeah, who is he? He translated Walter Moers, yes. Um, then could you say something about how the cultural aspects are translated uh, Paul this Bavarianismus? Yes, and I mean, it's, that's the, the thing you can't, translate in, Ger in the German books, Bol Poli is speaking Bavarian dialect or kind of an artificial Bavarian dialect I created because when you, when you write in dialect, nobody will understand beyond Bavaria. So I invented sort of an artificial Bavarian dialect. So pe people from Northern Germany you know, could understand this is probably, now she's probably speaking Bavarian dialect. And Bavarian in Germany is a very cute dialect. You can swear a lot um, uh, and, and, and in a very funny way in Bavarian. And it's a very cute, um, made up little grumpy dialect, which is uh, basically cute. And, um, but it's impossible to translate. Uh, I still remember that um, uh, in the nice, still in the 1980s, American movies where, you know, black people were speaking kind of a uh, kind of a social act spoken in New York, Bronx, wherever, um, were translated into Bavarian in in the German dubbing in the dub German version, which was totally weird and uh, inappropriate. Inappropriate. So it's um, uh, you don't translate dialects anymore. This is what I learned. So when you read the novels in English, you uh, you will, Pauli will speak, will always speak the same way. In the German novels, 
when she speaks German, she speaks dialect. And when she speaks Italian, then it's, you know, regular language. Yeah, I think, I, I don't know where I read or heard that, let's say, could Tante po Auntie Poldi series uh, be put on screen in England? or something? Was that some sort of discussion in yeah, the actually, Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, we had, we, um, there was a British um, a TV production, a big talk. Um, they're pretty big. They, they're part of, of ITV in, in the UK. They signed um, an option for, for Auntie Polly. And I was very excited because I love British TV and I love the human. And, um, and of course, they, the first thing they asked me is, what, what, how about, you know, Polly being Bavarian? I said, no problem. Make her Welsh, make her Scottish, I don't mind. Because it's not about Bavaria. It's about uh, a lady of a certain age from a distinctive region of a country where people speak some sort of funny dialect and her are some funny peoples. And then she comes to Sicily, which is a region in Italy where funny peoples live. Speaking a funny dialect, Italian dialect, very strong dialect. So she comes from one particular European region to, the, to another where they speak dialect. And I don't care if it's Welsh or Scottish or Irish, um, if it's funny. Um, so, of course, it could be, and, and an American adaption could be like a Midwest, oh no, in the Midwest, they don't have strong dialects, but, you know, a Southern dialect, for example, yeah. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I would be very curious about uh, seeing, a, I, I was very curious, in the end, um, it didn't work out, because the concept was not good enough. And but I would have loved to see a British uh, adaptation with an Auntie Poldi speaking, let's say Welsh. I, I would have loved it. Yeah. What? Okay, we we have lots of Brits here. If what would be equivalent to Bavaria, if you regard the whole UK? Is it Welsh? Is it Scottish? I don't know. Uh, I'd say Yorkshire. Yorkshire. I would also go for Yorkshire. Okay. Yeah. It's so the we... same. The sort of same um, type of individuality of the people. Okay. And yeah. also you've got, say, three different parts of Yorkshire. Mm -hmm. uh, North, uh, West and East Riding in the old days. And you've also got different parts of Bavaria, like Franconia, Upper Bavaria, right. Swabia. So there are a lot of parallels. Between oh, great. Yeah. And, I, would, um, I would love to see that. No, no, really, Yorkshire, they are, I love them because they are different, right? So if you check here in, in the uh, in chat, you know, you, Geordi, can, can somebody explain Geordi dialect a bit from the Brits? Mike, maybe you can. Uh, Geordie, uh, Northumberland is a, a part of England. Uh, I don't know very well at all. All I know is that um, they are very, in the olden days, they were closely related to the Frisians in uh, North West Germany and Holland. And they used to be able to understand each other about 200 years ago. Ah, uh, yes, I see. But uh, yeah, they, they are. You know, Yorkshire people from my, how I get them, they are, they are different because, I don't know, they are kind of, they really love their region. They are, I would say, hardworking and they have their rights, you know, it is like that, you know, they, it's a I bit know. of this stubbornness, I would say, really good hearts, they have beautiful hearts, but they are very own. Did I get that I right? Would you say you have to help me, the British people here? Uh, yes, that's uh, also typical of Yorkshire people. Yeah. Uh, okay. Stubborn and very individualistic. Yeah, but beautiful hearts, you know. Really. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very nice.
Uh, Glynis, maybe you can um, ask your questions because you, you put some things there. Mm -hmm. You mean the second question, Roma? Um, yeah, just... It's on the same theme. I'm very interested in how um, one tackles the cultural things in another when it's when the book is in translation. Um, I read the the book in German, and so I don't know what happens in the English, how things are tackled in the English version at all. Um, and then I wondered what happens with. Poldi and, and these same cultural things when the book is actually being read in Italian, because that's the, the culture to which, or part of the culture to which Poldi goes. Yeah, um, I was very curious and, and, and a little nervous when, when the book were, books were translated um, into Italian and came out in Italy. First of all, Italy is a very difficult book market. So everyone writes, nobody reads. So the book sold, the books sold uh, pr pretty, um, pretty bad. No one actually read it, but a few people read it. And then uh, I spoke to a, pe a few people who, who, who had read the, the books in Italian, not, not friends of mine, so I met people. And they said like, yes, we learned a lot about our country um, because for uh, if you you know if you observe you need a little distance and um, so uh, they found some truth in it um, because it's a little bit about Sicily um, told by a not so total stranger but you know guy who is uh, always between the chairs. And um, they kind of liked it. Um, that was um, very interesting for me. But the feedback was not so very much. Um, in the, 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 uh, it's, it's placed in Eastern uh, Sicily. And there's one town who's, um, or the town where Poldi lives belongs to a, com a community or a, 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 a little bigger town, which is called Riposto. And the, and the, and the, uh, uh, that uh, in Riposto, the town wanted to give me an award uh, a couple of years back because I I made some publicity for the region and uh, and maybe two or three tourists were traveling with a book and um, uh, but in the end I uh, it, there was no award I, I just said it um, but. Um, as far as I know, they uh, um, they they got something out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, because if I go to Sicily, I mean, you know, in this book, Mario describes where to get gelato, where to eat stuff, where to see stuff. I'm doing that. <laughs> I mean, we're so we're doing that for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah because. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 fun, of course, and and the food is nice, but um, I, I didn't want to to um, you know serve all the tourist cliches. I, I really wanted to to narrate a bit about Sicily, and food actually is an, is important because everyone is talking about food and is seriously talking about food because everyone is an expert in food. Uh, and it's bugging for me as a German because I like to talk about food and I like food. But you know, when you stay for a couple of weeks or even months in Sicily and everyone is still talk only talking about food, it you know it's really bugging because you start about talking about you know social issues and and politics and 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 and, and, and subjects you're interested about, and the people immediately turn the subjects to food again and uh, that's bugging and uh, and I wanted to even write about that not only the you know the the shiny sides and the touristic uh, um, sides of Sicily even the a little darker sides and or the bugging sides let's say there are a lot the dark sides are not a met not not a subject for Antipoldi so very much but at, at least the bugging sides of, of Sicilian uh, contemporary life. Mm -hmm. Super. Walter, you have also some questions. Would you like to read or say, ask? Would be okay? Uh, 
we have a, I don't want to interrupt, but I see a, um, a question uh -huh. in the chat. Okay, uh, oh, then, then let's do it. Right. That, that the classical writers and poets are necessary to be read or to be cast at school to provide kind uh, tools for ordinary students and in particular for people who intend to write stories. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, I agree. It's never, if you, if you want to become a writer, you need to read. Writers need to be readers. If you don't read, you can't write. I mean, this is, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a law of nature. And of course, I, I agree, it's important to have read a few classical writers. You don't, I don't think you need to have read all of them because it's impossible then. Uh, but you should, uh, you should have read a few of the, uh, as much as possible of the classical writers. And then, um, of course, you not only classical writers, but even contemporary writers, because then you can you you will immediately compare what uh, what gives you what do you get from from classical writers and what you get from contemporary writers. And sometimes, even as a young person, you will get more from Goethe than from any other uh, uh, contemporary writer, uh, uh, depending on your personal personal situation and um, and even if you want to learn and study as a writer if you start if you want to study writing uh, uh, it's very important to read the classical writers and not only the and when I say classical writers I even mean classical writers from the 20th century I actually I currently I'm, I'm very much again very much into um, the Latin American writers. I, I read uh, Fuentes a lot. I read uh, um, uh, Garcia, uh, Marquez and Garcia Marquez and, uh, and Allende and, and Vargas Llosa because I like, I, I try to understand what they do uh, because it's, the, it's I want what I'm writing right now, the family saga, is written in a magic realistic way because, you know, it's it's I, I live my Sicilian half now as a as a Mediterranean storyteller with Mediterranean means of storytelling. And I try to learn from the Latin American writers who are the, 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 the best in magic realism. And uh, uh, yeah, and I try to understand, and it's, it's a different reading. So uh, you have to read the masters. Yeah, learn from the good shit. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah super. Uh -huh. uh, Gabriela says Borges, Cortázar. Borges, yes, Borges, of course. Uh, yes. Gabriela, would you like to say, ask something? You're super welcome to do so. Oh, thank you. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to have to need to go now, but I, I don't want to. <laughs> It's I'm having good. A fun. I'm having a great time. Yes, yes. I, I just couldn't help myself participating, at least with texting. But no, no, I don't have any questions. I'm just learning so much. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, this will be then published, I hope, on our YouTube channel. Then you can rewatch. And uh, Mario has also some workshops sometimes, right? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes even in English, but. Uh, I will reduce it a little bit because I need to write my novel and uh, it's, it's uh, actually full time. Uh, it's a full time job, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, sometimes I have no, no capacities for, for online courses. But, one, but once in a while, um, I'm, I, I like it. And, and then I will offer new, new workshops in you know, little courses. I call them street food storytelling because I do it uh, at lunch breaks for an hour. And we talk about storytelling and, 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 and stuff very casual and um, uh, check out my Eventbrite site. And then once in a while you find a- So we, we can follow you on Eventbrite site and- um, Yeah, it's not really following because it's re I re I'm really active there. I'm just, but if you follow me on social, on, on, on social media, then I will always announce when there is, um, when there is an update with you know, the, 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 the workshops and, and all. Uh, follow me on my 
uh, I have actually I have three Insta accounts, and Antipoldi is is the account for the international works. But I'm will close it probably next year. So if you go on Insta on MarioGiordano.de, the same as my my website, you'll find me in German. Uh, you'll find me on Facebook. You you can check out my website. It's um, on Twitter wherever. I try to be regularly active on on socials but um i'm not 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 super active i don't have the time and the energy of you know to uh, do something uh, all the time okay so i'll just share quickly my screen wait a minute which one that one just a second so as always same principle well we here we had here, we had that one, that one was the presentation. So if we, if you want to buy his books, where can we buy your books? On your website, right? Um, you can buy the, the US edition directly from HMH from my website, yes, that's possible. Uh, otherwise, just go to your local book dealer. Um, mm -hmm. They'll be happy to order for you and uh, or order online mm -hmm. right uh, my books are available online and um but there's still uh local bookshops and i love look i love bookshops so yeah. go to your local book dealer thank you mario for your time oh thank you all thank you all very much it's, it's, it's been a pleasure and, maybe... and excuse, it's, please excuse my my clumsy english yeah mm -hmm. i'm sorry Maybe we'll meet again. Now we know you. We are now friends, translators. I don't know. You know us now. Super and maybe awesome. in person someday on some some literary festival or so. Yes. No, we, we should we... organize a reading for you. Oh yeah. That would be great. I mean, when the pandemic thing finally is over and we can travel again with no worries, then I'd love to meet oh, we some can, guys we, we can do that. We might have budgets as well. So that's one, Walter, that's one for our discussion because <laughs> we have to plan for next year or so. But yeah, this would be great. Okay, so that's it. Thank you so much. See you again and uh, all the best. Thank you, Mario. Thank all you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.